so many people saying that they've seen aliens. We had someone on this podcast actually that said they'd seen a- aliens. Not they'd seen aliens, but they had evidence that aliens existed. We want to know the night sky, go to an amateur astronomer. Amateur astronomers know the night sky. They know what the sun, moon, and stars are doing every night. They know they're very good at climate and weather because that affects whether things are visible. So they know when weather systems come in and go out and what things look like. You would think if aliens were about, up and about, that amateur astronomers would have seen more of them than anyone else. But they've seen less because we know what we're looking at. It's kind of that simple. The moment you know what you're looking at, it's an IFO, isn't it? Yeah. It's not a UFO. And so, yeah, I, I want to meet the aliens, but you're going to show me fuzzy video or you're going to say you have an alien, but it's in a locked box and you're not going to show it. If you have an alien in a locked box and you're not going to show it, that's the same thing to a scientist as not having an alien at all. Could you make the case for why aliens probably do exist and also the case for why they probably don't exist? No, no, they surely exist in this universe. The universe is 14 billion years old and the ingredients of life on Earth are the most common ingredients in the universe. And life began on Earth almost as quickly as it possibly could have. When Earth finally cooled down after it being formed, it was about 200 million years for signs of single-celled life. So even though we can't duplicate that yet, we don't know how, that's a frontier of biology, Earth didn't seem to have problems getting the job done within 200 million years. That's Earth. Now you have exoplanets everywhere across the galaxy. To suggest that life on Earth is alone in the universe, you'd have to have some point of philosophy that requires you believe that because it's not derived from actual uh, evidence or observations of the universe itself. So, uh, aliens, usually people mean intelligent aliens, but we're happy to find any kind of life at all. Bacterial life, uh, that would be, that would transform biology. What about in our galaxy, in the Milky Way galaxy? Yeah, the galaxy is the most sensible place to, so we've looked, in, we've looked for exoplanets. So What's that? A planet orbiting another star. Because if you're gonna look for life, you wanna, we presume it's gonna be on a planet. But there are some molecules up there. It's the exosphere. Okay. What's going on there? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's where the density of air from our atmosphere blends into the density of particles in interplanetary space. At which point you, can, you don't know I was which gonna, one you're- I was you're, gonna say, how do you make that dis- differentiation? You, it's when the densities are about the same, about and the then same. you're done. So, right. You're done with Earth's atmosphere yeah. at that point. You have transitioned. And where do we orbit our low Earth orbit objects? You know, the space station, the space shuttle. Right. Well, not the space shuttle space anymore. Shuttle, but SpaceX, yeah. right. uh, Crew Dragons, all of them. They all orbit sort of in the upper thermosphere. You may not know that we intermittently have to boost the space station. Why do we have to boost the orbit? Because especially the space station that's got all of these solar panels. Ah, because there's still some air molecules that's right. there. Right. So you don't want all that slapping up against there. It, except it happens. Right. That decays the orbit. Right. So every time we set up another craft, if it's in the schedule, it'll use its engines to boost it because there's still air molecules there. That's gotcha. it. When you get into the exosphere, you're far enough away that would never happen. And that's why, surely you've seen video from the space station orbiting Earth at night, and you're looking horizontally into aurora yeah i mean they're still above the they're aurora still above the aurora but it's it looks like it's like they're a boat on a lake yes and they're and it's shimmering yeah right there so Very they're cool. in that same layer of the atmosphere nice and like i said it's thousands of degrees but the temperature doesn't really well the temperature has no meaning as you said it has no just meaning. because of the way it's dispersed right. that's crazy yeah so there it is i lo- cannot come in and out of the solar system without having felt the influence of jupiter nice okay because word escape has very precise meaning that's true, yeah. i don't want to say it that I way so Jupiter is protecting Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Yeah. Period. So a comet comes in, it, it and it and it feels Jupiter, and then it swings out the other side. Right. And never even comes. Never in. even comes never, in to come, come towards come us. Out. Correct. Correct. Favorite space movie. Space movie. Well, sci-fi is The Matrix. Why? I love everything about it. The story is tight. There's one physics error in it, but without it, they don't have a movie. So you got to give it. To, I can write them a hall pass, which I feel that I have the power to do. <laughs> what was the, the error? Everyone's going to be wondering what the error was in the Matrix. Oh, it's not an error. It's just, they got, the, it's bad physics in it. Okay, so if you if you remember, the AI computer that's running everything needs an energy source. Mm. And so they're growing humans in these pods, knowing that each human radiates at about 80 watts. They didn't give that number, but it's a true fact. Uh, 80 watts, like an 80 watt bulb. That's how much energy you are consuming and using, that's an energy rate, okay? So they, and th- so one of the writers must have known that, and said, that's kind of cool, let's use humans as an energy source for the machines, all right. So there are these pods of humans, and they grow the humans from childhood to adulthood, and they put in their head a world that they're living in, which is just in their head, and they think it's real, but it's not. 
That's the matrix. Okay. But wait a minute. How do the humans get their energy? They feed the humans food. Well, why are you feeding food to humans and then using the energy from the humans for the machine? Bypass the middleman and just feed the machine. Something called the second law of thermodynamics, first or second law of thermodynamics, anytime energy changes from one form to another, it's not 100% efficient. You drive a car, if you drive a combustion engine car, you drive it 50 miles, get out, the engine's hot. Where'd the heat come from? That's wasted energy converting chemical energy of the gasoline to kinetic energy of your car. It is never 100% perfect. So they are losing energy in with this middleman, and they should just feed themselves whatever the food they're feeding the humans. And if they're smart, they would not have humans at all. But then there's no movie. So that's my point. Between and among the planets is exponential. Uh, in units of the Earth-Sun distance, okay. uh, Mercury is 0.4, Venus is 0.7, Earth is one. Right. One distance, okay? Of course it would be. Mars is two and a half. Oh. Jupiter is five. Oh. Saturn is 10. Oh. Uranus is 20. Neptune is 30. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> but, no, but the, the distance is getting really, really big, big really very big. fast. Very that's that's fast, right. the point of this, yeah. this lame exercise I'm trying to lay yeah. down. And so, the, so all of the inner planets basically are huddled compared to where Jupiter is. Right. And, and its ability to protect its inner children. Yeah. Oh, cool. Is that because the, uh, the mass of these other planets is so much bigger that they need more distance so they're not disturbing? They would clear the, out more they distance. They would clear out more distance. They would clear out more right. distance. Okay. But the formation of solar systems is still an active field. Because we used to think our so any other star system would look like our solar system. Right. That's the first assumption. Mm -hmm. And ain't none of them. Wow, that's so <laughs> Some cool. of them have Jupiters as close as Mercury is. Oh. They call hot Jupiters. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. How you doing? <laughs> you would be happier if you believed in God. I'm a pretty happy guy. Do you think you'd be happier? I don't know. I see people, I've seen very happy people in uh, celebrating their version of God. But then there are other people who are really happy in their version of God. And here's the problem. Deeply religious people typically find other religions, deeply religious people will declare for themselves and others in that religion that all the other religions are false. False. And if not false, just make preposterous claims. It is so obvious to them how false all the other religions are. Now you go to this religion. It is obvious how preposterous the rest of the religions are. You go around religion to religion. And so what's really going on here is devout people in so many of these religions are atheists to every religion but their own. Every religion but their own. Okay? How can a mountain have moved to Muhammad? That can't be. Okay. Oh, but yes, the creator of the universe impregnated a woman in the Middle East 2,000 years ago. That's more believable than anything in the Quran for this person. Okay. And then the Jews, he's saying, you're Jesus is the son of God. What are you, what are you crazy? Where'd you get that from? He's a good Jew, nice prophet, but son of God, you're going too far. So everybody's saying what's not true. So they're atheists for every other, they just don't believe any other religion. Whereas an actual atheist just has one more religion to that category. It's your religion. The atheist agrees with you that all the other religions are preposterous in their claims, but they also believe, they also think your religion is preposterous and people don't accept that. They don't, it doesn't land well. So I don't have any problems with people being religious. I don't have any issues with that. It's, um, I don't try to impose my, I, other people try to do it. I've seen them do this. I have a quote where I'm misquoted just because they want me on their side. Okay, you ready? It's a simple quote. If every time I tell you science doesn't understand it, and you say, well, God must be that. God made the universe because we don't, God made life because we don't know how to make life yet. God, if that's, if that is your definition and understanding of God, then as science progresses, it will solve these questions, pushing the God back outward to places that have yet to be discovered. And so the quote is, if to you God is where science has yet to tread, then God is an ever receding pocket of scientific ignorance. That's, that, that references what philosophers have called God of the gaps. It goes way back, thousands of years. If we don't understand it, there's a God. The storm is Poseidon, okay? Lightning bolt struck, it's Zeus. 
right? That's God of the Gaps. God of the Gaps is a time-honored exercise in human civilization. And all I'm saying is that statement is objectively true because it's an if statement. If to you, God is where science has yet to tread, then as science continues to tread, you're a pocket, a shrinking pocket of scientific, that's your God, okay? It's not an opinion, that's a statement of an if statement, the consequences of an if statement. I've had people take the second half and put it on a t-shirt. God is an ever receding pocket of scientific uh, ignorance. Neil deGrasse Tyson, that's not what I said. That's half of what I said. And that's only true if to you, God, is where science has yet to tread. But to pull that out and make that the truth? No. I would never make such a statement.